Um, up until now, we've mainly been focusing on um, what human rights law protects, how the human rights code works to prevent discrimination, what your rights are as a person with a disability on the job to, for example, seek accommodations from your employer. And we talked last time about how to approach your employer to ask for those accommodations if you need them on the job. And so we've really been focused on preventing human rights complaints and what happens um, before it gets to the stage where somebody might feel like they need to make a complaint. My hope for you is that you never find yourself in the situation of having to make a human rights complaint. But of course, sometimes the situation just is not solvable or the person that you're trying to solve the problem with is not open to your suggestions or your ideas for resolution. Um, or there just is no alternative but to file a human rights complaint or that just feels like something that you need to do or is important for you to do. And so if it gets to that stage, what we're going to talk about today is a bit more information about how to do that and uh, some of the resources that are available to you should you need some help and um, just a bit more about what the process looks like. This is a screenshot from the Human Rights Tribunal's website and this is where you would go if you needed to file a human rights complaint. If you remember in the very first workshop, <coughs> pretty sure it was the very first one, uh, I told you that uh, it's free to file a human rights complaint. The forms are available online and anyone can go right here to this page of the Human Rights Tribunal website, get the form they need and fill it out and send it to the tribunal. You can mail it, you can fax it, you can email it, you can take it in person, and you can start your human rights complaint in that way. And you see that there are four options here for filing a complaint. The first is to file your own complaint. And that's what most people do. Most people write their own story and file their own complaint on their own behalf. There's also the option to file a complaint for another person. We sometimes see parents doing that on behalf of their child. Sometimes I've seen um, a spouse file a complaint on behalf of their spouse, um, who maybe just isn't in the right state of mind to do a complaint by themselves. Um, the case that I saw, it was a complaint about pregnancy discrimination and so the husband filed on behalf of the wife who was nine months pregnant and was about to give birth and didn't think that making a human rights complaint was something that she could do on her own right then. Um, it's also possible that um, somebody could give you permission to file a complaint on their behalf and that's happened before. In fact in the husband-wife situation she gave him permission to file on her behalf. Option three there is file a complaint for a group or a class of persons. And group complaints and class complaints are complaints that involve more than one person. More than one person is bringing that complaint forward. They're a little bit different. A group complaint involves an identifiable group of people. For example, a group of five women who all work at the same workplace and they've all been subjected to sexual harassment on the job. That would be a group complaint. There are five of them. We know exactly who they are. Each one would have a slightly different but related story and they could file a complaint together as a group. The other complaint, a class complaint, is a little bit different. In a class complaint, we don't necessarily know exactly who is in the class, but we know the general characteristics of the class. So for example, a class complaint <coughs> could be brought by all visually impaired people living in the Lower Mainland 
who use transit. And maybe they want to make a complaint about the way that tra the transit system is delivered and want to argue that it does not accommodate their needs as visually impaired people. So that class is kind of defined by their characteristics. People who are visually impaired, they live in the lower mainland and they use transit. But when we file that complaint, we don't know exactly how many people are in that class and exactly what their experience has been. Does that make sense, that difference between a group complaint and a class complaint? Okay, great. The other kind of complaint somebody can make is a retaliation complaint. If you file a human rights complaint, or even if you tell your boss or your landlord that you're thinking about, or you might make a human rights complaint, the Human Rights Code gives you protection from retaliation. You can't be punished or otherwise treated badly because you've made a human rights complaint or because you've suggested that you might make a human rights complaint. And we see quite a few retaliation complaints get made. Somebody files a human rights complaint <clears throat> and they suddenly get evicted. Somebody files a human rights complaint against their employer and they suddenly get fired. Um, it's not a guarantee that it was retaliation for making the human rights complaint, but sometimes it is. And so that's another kind of complaint that, that someone could make. So each one of those kinds of complaints has a different form. You can see form 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, .1 and a link to the appropriate form. So if you were deciding, I'm going to make a human rights complaint, you would go to this page and you would click the right kind of complaint that you want to make. As I mentioned before, most of the time people make a complaint on their own behalf and they would use Form 1.1. And you can see that there's an online version and a print version. If you choose the online version, you can fill out <coughs> the complaint and tell your story right there on the page. But you can also print it out and write on the complaint form if you prefer that. or and this is what I usually do and usually advise people to do. I tell people to just write see attached on the complaint form and then they can tell their story on a separate piece of paper and then you can tell it however you want. And you don't feel like you have to fit it in these small little boxes. And this is what the form looks like. This is a, a copy of the form. And this is the part of the form where you name the respondents. Who is your complaint? about. We've seen this slide before. These are potential people or entities that could be respondents. You may remember my point um, that I made a couple times, I think, and Sarah did too. And I think the way that I said it was the buck stops with the employer, with the company, with the institution that is responsible for the workplace. So sometimes when people come to me for advice, they want to know, well, you know, the HR manager was the one that was a real jerk to me. And then my supervisor called me up and told me that I wasn't going to get the accommodations that I was looking for. So my human rights complaint is against them, right? I name the HR <laughs> advisor and my supervisor. And the answer is actually probably not. The respondent should be the company. They are ultimately responsible for ensuring that you are at work um, and not facing any discrimination. That's really what that first point means. The employer has a duty to provide a discrimination-free workplace, and the buck stops with them. And even if it's not, you know, the general manager or the CEO of the company that's doing the discriminating, the fact that discrimination is happening kind of on their watch means that it's the company that's ultimately responsible and in the legal context, we use the word liable, legally liable, legally responsible for the discrimination. And that goes for the other places and areas of life that the code applies to. Tenancy, it's the landlord who's ultimately responsible for ensuring that 
your home is discrimination free and so if there's another tenant for example who is harassing someone or discriminating against them if the landlord doesn't do anything about that it's the landlord that can be held responsible for that behavior sometimes it's appropriate to name an individual respondent as well as the company but the, the person, the individual, has to be acting outside of the scope of their job duties if they're going to be held individually responsible for discrimination. So the shift supervisor that calls you up and says, you know, Jim, I'm sorry, but we're just, we're not going to be able to provide that um, uh, technology that you were hoping for at your workspace to accommodate your disability we just we can't afford it we're not going to provide it um, that supervisor is carrying out their job duties they that decision may be discrimination that decision may discriminate on the basis of disability but it's not really the supervisor's fault she's kind of the messenger in that situation the company could be responsible but the supervisor Probably not. She's just passing the information along. However, if that same supervisor started making really nasty comments about Jim's disability, harassing Jim about um, his disability or any other protected characteristic, then you can't say that the supervisor is just doing her job. She's acting way outside the scope of what her job is. And in that kind of a situation where she's harassing or otherwise, um, you know, just kind of going rogue <laughs> and, and acting outside of her job duties, then she could be held individually liable. This is just a reminder. Again, these are slides that you've seen before. This is just a reminder of where the Human Rights Code applies. As you know, it doesn't apply everywhere. It doesn't apply to every aspect of our daily life. If somebody sexually harasses you as you walk down the sidewalk, none of these areas are really going to apply. You're not going to be able to make a human rights complaint about that behavior. But if sexual harassment happens on the job or in the context of a tenancy relationship with a landlord, or when you're purchasing property, or when you're accessing accommodation services and facilities that are customarily available to the public, then the code applies. Those things, those services have to be provided in a discriminatory, a discrimination-free way. And this hasn't really been tested, but something that I've been thinking about lately is, you know, so sexual harassment, if it happens on the sidewalk, Nobody's providing a service at that stage, so there's nobody to make a human rights complaint against. But what if it happened on the SkyTrain? And what if the transit authorities, I'm really picking on transit today, mm -hmm. but uh, what if the transit authorities know that there are real problems of sexual harassment on the SkyTrain and they don't do anything about it? It's all mics. There's mics, there's videos, sure, yeah, there's ways that they should know what's happening and should be taking action. And they are providing service, right? The buses, the sky trains, those are services that are customarily available to the public. This is a copy of one of the information pages right in the complaint form. If you remember back on the um, screenshot of the web page with the four forms on it, you had the choice between the online form or the print form. One thing that's great about the print form is that every other page is an info page that explains how you fill out the facing page. So as you go through it and open it, on the back side, you're gonna have information about how to fill out the front side. And this is the information page about the various areas of discrimination under the Human Rights Code. So you can see a short description of the places where the Human Rights Code applies. And this information is provided right in the complaint form so you have pretty easy um, access to that information.
And this is the list of prohibited grounds of discrimination. We talked about how the code doesn't apply to every kind of different treatment or disadvantage that might happen. It applies to negative treatment that happens on the basis of one of these characteristics. Not every ground applies in every area. This is a bit small, I'm sorry if it's hard to see. Um, but what you can see is that, for example, um, political belief, fifth from the top, is only protected in the context of employment. Your political belief is not protected from discrimination in the context of your tenancy, for example. Your landlord doesn't have to let you put a sign for a po particular political candidate, for example, uh, in your window or on the lawn. Um, most of the grounds apply in all of the areas. You can see that protection from discrimination on the basis of disability there in the middle applies everywhere. <coughs> Employment, services, purchase of property and tenancy. Um, but there are some that don't apply everywhere. So it's just important to make sure that if you are making a claim about discrimination on the basis of your political belief, for example, you're doing that in the employment context and not in some other area where it actually doesn't apply. So source of income, that's a good example, that's the one on the bottom, it's only protected in the context of tenancy. So what that means is that a landlord can't say, I'm not going to rent to you because you are on a pension or receiving disability or because your income comes from whatever source. As long as the source is legal, <laughs> the landlord is not allowed to discriminate. Mm -hmm. If your income is coming from criminal activity, for example, the landlord's allowed to say that's not okay, but if it's coming from government benefits or some other source, they are not allowed to use that against you in, the, in a tenancy yeah, decision. And yet we know that they do. We know that it happens all the time. Now, it's a little bit tricky because landlords are allowed to do credit checks and they're allowed to make sure that you can afford the rent. And because, for example, disability payments are so low, um, there may be circumstances where people who are on disability actually can't afford to live in a particular unit. And the landlord might be justified in those situations by saying, I don't, I'm not going to rent this $900 a month unit to you if your only income is disability at $986 or whatever the amount is right now. Just so you know, um, education is a part of what our human rights clinic does. And um, I've done some education with landlords over the years and uh, have talked about that issue in particular because we know that it happens. Um, we know that discrimination on the basis of family status happens in landlord tenancy contexts. I've also heard of landlords saying, oh, we don't, I don't rent to single mothers. Mm -hmm. I don't rent to people on disability. It's against the law. It's a human rights problem, but we know that it happens. And we know that it's really difficult to bring a human rights complaint forward about it when you're looking for a place to live and you have sort of more urgent pressing issues um, to why. deal with. Who remembers how long you have to make a human rights complaint after something like that happens to you? A year. Nice, you have one year, exactly. Um, it's longer than it used to be. It used to only be six months, but it's now a year. So there is that um, possibility that you sort of deal with your immediate urgent situation of getting housing and have some time to then decide whether you want to make a human rights complaint about what happened or not. I talked about how you tell your story in a human rights complaint and how maybe you just on the form write see attached and then you make your own document that tells the story. Really what you need to make sure your story includes are those three things. What did the respondent do? What happened? What was the negative impact on you? And then how was 
one or more of those protected characteristics that we just looked at, how were those a factor in what happened to you? And those are really the essential elements of your story. If you tell a story that describes something negative that happened to you that a respondent did and provided that it falls within one of those areas, employment, tenancy, or services, and you can at least provide some um, sense that your protected characteristic, whether it was your disability, or your gender, or your sexual orientation, or whatever it was, as long as there's some indication that that characteristic was a factor in, in the treatment and what happened and why, then you will get your complaint in the door at the Human Rights Tribunal, and provided it's within a year. <laughs> if you're filing your complaint late, you might face some problems in getting it through the door, but if you've checked all of those boxes, then I would expect the complaint to be accepted for filing by the tribunal. I think a really helpful way to tell your story is with a chronology, with a sequence of events. On this date, this happened. Then on this date, this next thing happened. And then on this date, another thing happened. And, and kind of go through it like that. So I generally encourage people to write up their story in that way. Um, just keeps it really clear concise what happened in what order it happened and uh, it helps the tribunal understand sort of how the situation unfolded. Sometimes when discrimination happens there are multiple legal issues going on and a variety of different places where a legal claim could get made. In the employment context there's something called the Employment Standards Branch. And the Employment Standards Branch deals with things like, did you get paid your proper overtime? And if they fired you, did you get the appropriate amount of notice or money instead of notice, for example? Um, did you receive all of the pay that you were legally entitled to be paid? Those are the kinds of things that the Employment Standards Branch deals with. If you belong to a union, your union might make what's called a grievance about how you were treated on the job. And I see lots of times where there are both human rights complaints and union grievances happening at the same time. You could make a claim in court for wrongful dismissal um, if you were terminated and that termination was discriminatory. We know the residential tenancy branch exists to deal with issues related to tenancy and some of those issues might have a discriminatory aspect to them too. So there can be a variety of different legal proceedings going on all at the same time, which can make things complicated. They all have their own rules and their own legal standards and their own time limits and a variety of different things. Um, and, and our clinic unfortunately is only able to help with the human rights aspect of things. Um, Jim and Sarah deal with employment law much more broadly, so they can do things like employment standards, um, wrongful dismissal claims. You guys do some union stuff too, right? They do. Yeah, so in the employment context, most employment lawyers can do a variety of different things. Our free legal clinic is just focused on human rights, but in any event, um, what you might want to know is whether all of those things can happen at the same time. And the short answer is that generally, yes, you can have multiple claims going on at the same time. But what you can't do is double dip. If you make an employment standards complaint, for example, and you get some wage compensation through that, you can't get the same wages again in the human rights tribunal process. What you also can't do is, um, is um, have competing findings of fact, competing um, decisions about kind of essential elements of the case. So what might happen is that the um, employment standards complaint goes faster 
than the Human Rights Tribunal complaint. And at employment standards, a bunch of things get kind of found as a fact by the decision maker there. Chances are those findings are going to get incorporated over into the Human Rights Tribunal process. The other thing to know is that it's also possible to defer a human rights complaint and just kind of press the pause button on the human rights complaint while another proceeding goes ahead. And one reason for doing that is in particular in a unionized environment, a union grievance can actually resolve a human rights complaint. That's the only other place that actually has the authority to decide whether discrimination happened. The residential tenancy branch can't decide whether discrimination happened. Not even the court will decide about discrimination. So um, if you have court proceedings and a human rights complaint, those can go along at the same time because they deal with different things. But a union grievance can deal with the same kinds of things as a human rights complaint. So there are some cases where you might decide to just press pause on the human rights complaint because the union um, proceeding will go faster. In your complaint form, you also write out what you're looking for, what you're hoping to get out of the complaint, what kind of remedy, that's the language that we use in the legal world, um, what kind of remedy you're looking for out of the complaint. And the tribunal can order a variety of different kinds of remedies. They can make an order that the respondent stop contravening the code and not commit the same violation of the code in the future. Um, they can declare that the conduct was discrimination. They do that in every case where they find discrimination happened. They can order a respondent to do this that will help prevent discrimination from happening in the future. Maybe change a policy, maybe get some training, um, other kinds of big picture type remedies that help prevent future discrimination. Most common remedies that people are looking for are the last two there. Compensate for wages or salary lost and for expenses incurred as a result of the discrimination. When you lost wages, you might ask for compensation for the wages that you didn't get paid. Um, if you had to spend money because of the discrimination, you can ask for those co costs to be compensated. And you can also ask for compensation for injury to dignity, feelings, and self-respect. And that's like the pain and suffering that's caused by discrimination. The more personal, emotional, psychological impact that the discrimination had on you. And that number is decided on by the tribunal based on a number of things, including how bad they think the discrimination was, did it happen just once or did it happen many times? How vulnerable was the person that the discrimination happened to? Um, those, those kinds of factors. How significant of an impact did it have on the person? This is a little timeline for a complaint. And what you can expect if you file a human rights complaint is a process that doesn't move super quickly, but that certainly doesn't drag on to the same extent that many other legal proceedings do. Like a claim in court will take years in most cases to resolve. The Human Rights Tribunal, it will probably take a, at least a year, maybe two, but most complaints are concluded in between one to two years if they go all the way to a hearing and there are ways that the process can end much sooner than one to two years so when you file a complaint your complaint provided that you met those requirements that i mentioned a moment ago um, your complaint will be accepted for filing by the tribunal and you'll get a letter back from the tribunal saying we've accepted your complaint and they will send the complaint to the respondent the person or business that the complaint is about. They get a copy of the complaint 
and they're told, okay, now you have to respond. You have to re file a response to this complaint. What's your side of the story? Um, but before that, the parties have the option of attending an early settlement meeting. That's what ESM <laughs> will be scheduled if the parties want to participate within about three to four months is my experience. Sometimes based on vacation schedules and people out of town, sometimes it takes a bit longer to schedule the ESM, but in general, the tribunal is usually able to get one in the calendar within about three to four months after you have filed your human rights complaint, provided that both sides want to participate in that. And Jim's gonna tell you a lot more about mediations in just a moment, and I'll just go through the rest of the timeline. Um, an early settlement meeting is an opportunity to see if you can resolve the complaint without a hearing. And so if you do, great, the complaint is over, you'll withdraw it, you'll um, get the benefit of whatever you've agreed to with the, the other side, and that will be the end of the process. But if there's no settlement at the early settlement meeting, if it just doesn't work, you're not able to come to an agreement, then the complaint proceeds, and that's when the respondent has to file their response, their side of the story, and they have 35 days to do that. The next thing that happens in the complaint process is document disclosure. Both parties have a legal responsibility to give the other side any documents they have that are relevant to the complaint. So that might be things like pay stubs, emails, text messages, work contracts, those kinds of documents that you have that say something about what your complaint is all about. And both sides have to do that. The complainant does theirs first and then the respondent does theirs 35 days later and you'll get a big package of documents that are relevant to the complaint. The respondent also has the option to make what's called an application to dismiss the complaint. And that's a preliminary application and that just means preliminary before, like way, way before the hearing they can apply to have the complaint thrown out, dismissed without a hearing on the basis that, well, there's a few different reasons a respondent might get a complaint tossed out, but the most common one that respondents rely on is that the complaint has no reasonable prospect of success. And they try to make the argument that, you know, this, this complaint doesn't deserve to go to a hearing because we're going to be able to show for sure, we're going to be able to show we didn't discriminate. Um, there was no connection between this complainant's disability and how they were treated. Um, we accommodated them to the best of our ability. We didn't discriminate. And so the complaint shouldn't be heard. And um, if they make that application, then as a complainant, you get the chance to respond and to try to show the tribunal why the complaint should be allowed to go all the way to a hearing and the, wh why the tribunal should hear all of the evidence and make a decision after a hearing rather than just tossing the complaint out now. Um, and an application to dismiss really slows down the process. Um, because it gets filed and then the complainant makes their submissions in response and then the tribunal has to take a bunch of time to make their decision. So you'll probably wait several months to get a decision on the application to dismiss. But provided that the tribunal agrees, okay, yes, the complaint should be allowed to proceed, they deny the application to dismiss, then the hearing gets scheduled. And that's usually a further six to eight months down the road. Then the hearing happens, and then it takes a few months to get a decision. I put six to eight months in there for a decision, and sometimes it does take that long. What I'm noticing lately, Jim, I don't know if you're seeing this as well, is that um, the tribunal is giving decisions after hearings pretty fast. Applications to dismiss are still taking forever, but hearing decisions are coming out within a month or two. So that last line there should probably be changed um, to reflect a kind of newer phenomenon, at least as far as, as far as what we're seeing, that the decisions are coming out a bit faster. Has everyone gotten one of these forms? It should say at the very top, 
DC Human Rights Tribunal agreement to participate in mediation? Anyone does not have one of those forms? So this is actually the form which you get right away and are required to sign if you are ever um, participating in one of these mediations. I thought I'd go over this because reading it over, I realized that if I did not go to law school and I were to see this, and if I didn't have a lawyer beside me or whoever understood the language, I would be really intimidated and this would totally wreck my day. <laughs> so why don't we start by trying to figure out what this is. Um, we'll start with the first one where it says purpose of mediation. So it uses a lot of fancy legal language, mentions that we are participating in this mediation in good faith for the purpose of resolving all or part of this complaint. What this really means in plain simple language is today we're going to try to settle this so that you go home, you don't have to worry about attending this through a hearing. And that's the whole purpose of mediation. It's you, there's there are a lot of possibilities what can happen with a human rights complaint. Some abandon their complaints. Um, some go through a hearing. Some get dismissed. But the vast vast majority of all complaints they settle. How it works in terms of the actual process is you go to the human rights office. It's actually located in downtown. You go inside there, they put you inside a room. That room is actually separate from where the respondent is sitting. And generally my experience is the mediator will hop around both rooms to um, exchange offers. So you're always either by yourself, you can bring a family member, you can bring whoever you think would give you some support. And it can last for a few minutes. I've seen cases where people just walk out after a few minutes. I've done ones where it actually lasted the whole day. It was actually very productive. So there's no actual time limit. Um, sort of bit of, bit of a word of caution. Make sure you bring something to um, reading materials, a game, because there will be moments where you're waiting for the other side to give you a response to your offer and that can take a few seconds, it can take up to an hour. You have the time to consider offers and to um, decide whether if you want to take it or if you want to leave it. What does a mediator do? So a mediator usually is a trained lawyer, but their purpose is not to act as your lawyer. So let me explain what that means. The mediator will give suggestions, give his or her personal opinion about what you're proposing, whether he or she believes it will be realistic. But what they can't not do is they can't tell you whether that's a fair offer, whether you should take it. They're not there to act on your behalf. They're not there to act on the respondent's behalf. They're there to help the parties reach an agreement. Everything you say at the mediation is confidential. So what does this mean? Let's say you exchange some information. You share some information that might potentially damage either your case or the other party's case. Well, you cannot use that information for the actual hearing. You cannot later say, well, at the early settlement meeting, you told me this, so now you're changing your perspective. You're not allowed to do that. And the whole reason why is because it's there for you to exchange information out in the open, tell the other side what you want and to assist in a process of helping the parties find some sort of common resolution. If at any point, let's say you are attending the mediation by yourself and you need to give your significant other a phone call, a friend that you trust, you are at liberty to do that. 
The only exception is you have to tell whoever it is you call that um, to keep the information confidential, not to tell anyone else. The mediator will also be there to exchange the information that he or she thinks would assist the parties to settle. So for example, let's say you, um, you make a complaint against your employer saying that I believe I was discriminated. He fired me because um, at the time I, I was in the midst of adopting a child and the day afterwards he told me we're going to find someone else in your position. Well, the mediator might come back with you with news. Well, Jim, I just told him about the situation. Did you know that he had a, his business fell apart the very next day and there was no way for him to sustain his business anymore? So the mediator will come back with that, those pieces of information. Again, that information, it's, it's kept confidential, but it's there to help the parties um, assist towards settlement. So what happens if, what happens during a settlement? There's two possibilities. One is you agree to settle. So the parties then would sign a piece of paper whereby they acknowledge that the matter has been settled and that would effectively conclude the complaint. The complaint will essentially be over at that point. Uh, the other possibility is that the parties decide not to settle. What that does is um, the complaint is still there, it remains intact, and at that point there are options available which Laura just described. The respondent can apply for an application to dismiss. What that means is if they're successful, they do have a, a paper application, very long document. If they're successful, then your complaint is dismissed, at which point everything you ask for, you get nothing. Or the, the application to dismiss does not succeed, or they do not do one. At that point, you have the option to schedule yourself an actual hearing. And at that point, at the hearing, that's when a tribunal member will decide on the issue. Should you or should you not participate? I always recommend participating. Settlements, generally speaking, get you something. And it's always a good opportunity to um, see what you can get rather than go straight towards a hearing. Hearings are very risky. It's always the case where one party gets nothing, the party gets everything. You might not even be happy with what the tribunal member says. A tribunal member might say, okay, I find that there was discrimination. I found that you had indeed uh, lost your job because of discrimination, but guess what? I don't think you're entitled to as much compensation as you think you can get. And at that point, you went through the uh, mediation, you actually got an amount that was a lot higher than what you got. Well, too bad, you had your chance over at mediation and now you're stuck with this judgment. So always consider um, doing mediations because they are generally bad. It's always generally better when the parties come together and make a decision rather than have someone else make a decision for them. So that was a lot of theoretical things I was talking about. Uh, I thought probably the best way to demonstrate what I've been saying is to actually show you what a real media, well, what I think a real mediation looks like. So Laura and I are going to play roles. Laura's gonna be a mediator. I'm gonna be both the complainant and the respondent. I've taken some create, creative measures to do that. I'm hoping it actually works. If this turns out to be the most horrific play you've seen, just keep in <laughs> mind I'm a lawyer, I'm not a screenwriter or playwright or anything of that sort. So you wanna? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, Marco. I'm Hi. Laura. I'm going to be the mediator for your session today. Okay. Are you just here on your own? Just on my own. You don't have a lawyer with you today? Oh, no. I, I watch a lot of these. I watch suits every day, so I know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, well, I wanted to come in and introduce myself. Um, I wanted to let you know that the respondent in your case, um, Jim Wu, who is here for uh, the XYZ Construction Company, he's also here. He's sitting in a room just down the hall, and after we have a brief chat, I'll go in and speak to him okay. as well. Um, you know Jim? Yeah, he's my twin brother. Why? Well, I, he used to be my twin brother until we had this spat. We're identical twins. I see. Okay, the respondent is your identical twin. Interesting. We're also quite estranged, but yes, I, I You're I know. estranged. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, um, he is in the other room, and uh, it's really up to the two of you whether you want to meet together or not. Okay. If you'd like to stay in separate rooms, that's fine with me and I'm happy to just go back and forth. But if you would like to come together in the same room, we can also make that happen. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have any questions about anything so far about the process? Yeah. Do you know how long it's going to take? That's a good question. So it really is up to the parties how long it's going to take. Sometimes mediations are done very quickly and sometimes they take all day. We can take breaks anytime you want to. We'll take a pause mm -hmm. over the lunch hour if we're still going at that time. Okay. Um, there are washrooms just out the door and to the right there, um, and you can just let me know um, if you need to take a break at any time. Sure. Okay. Um, have you ever done anything like this before? Have you ever done a mediation before? Nope. Okay. Well, did you receive this document from the tribunal? I did. The yeah. agreement to participate? Yeah, they emailed it over to me. Great. Okay. So, both of the parties will, um, will sign this agreement okay. and it just sets out what my job is, mm -hmm. what your job is. Okay. Um, it sets out the fact that the discussions will be confidential here today and nothing that you say today can get used against you down the road okay. in a hearing or any other proceeding. Um, if your complaint settles today, I'll pass that information along to the tribunal. If okay. your complaint doesn't settle today, I'll also let the tribunal know that mm -hmm. and they'll move the process along. Okay. I'm not a tribunal member. I'm a mediator uh, here on contract mm -hmm. with the Human Rights Tribunal. So if your complaint proceeds to a hearing, I won't be involved in any oh, okay. way. And I'll destroy all of my notes and keep everything confidential myself. Mm -hmm. I'll also sign this confidentiality oh, agreement so that we're all, um, we all understand what, what everybody's role is. Okay. Okay. Um, so, I will have you sign this and mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll pop over into the other room and speak to the respondent. Sure. Just got like a quick question. The mm -hmm. language looks pretty hardcore. Do you think I should have gotten a lawyer before I came over here? Well, that's really not a question I can answer okay. for you. Um, but what I can say is that I'll give you as much time as you need to think about any offers that the respondent puts on the table. And um, while I can't give you legal advice about those offers, I'll try to make sure that I explain what's on the table as clearly as I can. Okay. And just um, breaking the, what's it called? The third wall, yeah. fourth wall yeah. for a moment. What I would also say as a um, representative of the clinic, to any of you who might be participating in a mediation at any time, you can also phone the clinic during your mediation and get some legal advice right in the moment. Um, it's best if we've made that arrangement in advance so we can make sure that somebody is available to take your call. But if you, um, if our clinic, for example, hasn't been able to provide a lawyer or an advocate to go with you to the mediation, we can almost certainly talk to you on the phone as the mediation goes along if you need some advice about an offer or about a term of the settlement that you're being asked to agree to. We'll try to make that happen for you. So 
Just wanted to make a note of that right now, and we'll go back to That's very good advice. Team. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay, so um, thank All you, done. Marco. Thank you for signing that. I'm gonna take this over and uh, meet with Jim now. Okay. And I'm gonna actually get up. Hi there, you must be Jim. Hi. Hi, Jim, I'm Laura, I'm the mediator. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So I um, was just in the other room with Marco. Okay. And we went through the agreement to participate okay. in mediation yep. together. You've had a chance to look at that. Yeah, I, I've had counsel. He's he's not here today, but he's been guiding me through the process. So okay. I'm quite familiar with what the form is about. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so you've had a chance to sign off yep. on that and agree. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna go back then mm -hmm. to uh, to meet with Marco again okay. and get his perspective about the complaint, and then I'll come back and uh, and meet with you and let you know what he has to say. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Okay, Marco, why don't you tell me a little bit about what your complaint is all about? Sure. So I. So even though we we're twins, uh, Jim and I separated a long time ago and we've been living apart since we were babies. He's in Vancouver, I'm over, at, I was over at Winnipeg. Anyways, before- I'll just say you look remarkably similar. <laughs> you really are. I get that a lot, twins. I get that a lot. Um, <laughs> even though he's living in a much warmer place in Winnipeg. Um, anyways, before I started at his company, I. I was actually a plumber for 10 years. Uh, two years ago, I was skiing over at Whistler and I had a freak accident. So um, it completely took out my back. Mm -hmm. I did some physio, I became a lot better, but I tried to go back to the plumbing business. It, it just didn't work out. I would stand for a while and then the pain will return. I would just experience all this sharp pain. Uh, it was good that my brother or Jim was housing me at his home for free at my aunt during this time and one day he, he has his own construction business so he, one day he just asked me do you want to work for me well i told him well if i do it's going to be something that's you know what i'm going through it's going to be something that's probably going to be a desk job because i am in a lot of pain if i do a lot of hard labor he said oh yeah sure we have i have a lot of laborers they can definitely use their experience and uh, your leadership you might be expected to do some some jobs on the floor but it's just going to be guiding my employees showing them the ropes okay he offered you a job that was going to accommodate your injury and not require you to be doing the kind of physical exactly. labor, that, labor that you used to do but exactly. can't anymore because of your injury exactly. okay i understand <clears throat> so we had it we did I worked with him. The first week was great. Everything like he told me. Second week, we started losing a few employees. He had this very big project assigned for him. He was he couldn't find a replacement, so I had to um, give some substitute labor work. Um, it involved a bit of plumbing, a lot of um, construction work. It really started to hurt my back again. Mm. So I told Jim, look, I can't, how long can I do this? If it's just something for a day or two, I can do it. He told me, well, we're, gonna, we're in the midst of finding someone to, re <coughs> to, to replace the role. Can you just please be in the position for another few days? I guarantee you, I'll find something for you, for, uh, find something for us. You'll be back in your position right away. I see. So a few days became a few weeks. Mm. Meanwhile, you're continuing to do physical labor and it's making your back injury it's, worse. It's, it was really horrible. It got to the point where I couldn't even sleep anymore because the pain was just unbearable, mm -hmm. even with the painkillers. Mm -hmm. So finally, I think about, we gave this another few weeks. Um, I asked Jim, "How are you gonna be hiring anyone soon? Yeah. He told me, well, I'm really caught up in all of this. Can you, I mean, you're an expert in this. You've been doing this for the last 10 years. I mean, it's probably just a piece of cake for you. 
I don't know why you're making such a big fuss out of this. Oh, and were you telling him about the pain that you oh, were experiencing? Oh yeah, he, he knew this. I mean, I was, I, I still was living at his place at the time, so he, mm -hmm. he knew I was going through a lot of pain and that this was obviously bothering me. But Jim being Jim, he loves the money. <laughs> so he told me to stay and so I gave it another few days and finally I told him, look, this isn't going to work out. You gotta have to find someone else. Mm -hmm. What did he say? Oh, he was very angry. He's, he asked me, "What are you? What are you saying? Are you are you bailing on me at, at this moment?" Mm -hmm. And then I told him, "No, but I, I can't continue this." He took, at which point, he said, "Well, I'm not. I, I I can't find a replacement for you soon." At which point, well, then unfortunately, I I got to quit Jim. Because my my body cannot function like it, it did right. before. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you filed this human rights complaint now yeah. on the basis of your disability, and um, you've made a claim mm -hmm. that Jim and the construction company have discriminated against you yeah. because they haven't accommodated your right. your disability. Um, what are you hoping to get out of this mediation today? What's your position? on a reasonable settlement? I think the biggest thing that got me going was it wasn't so much the fact that I quit and it was Jim's reaction to it. So uh, let me tell you something that happened afterwards. The minute I told him I was quitting, then he got all ballistic at me, started asking me to pay all the um, back rent Mm -hmm. I told him, well, Jim, he told me that I didn't have to pay the rent. It's like, well, now you do because you owe me. You left. I'm probably going to lose this project and I'm not going to be able to feed my family. So you're going to be the one that's compensating for it. I told him, Jim, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right at this moment. I have got no job. How do you expect me to, to, to do that? He said, well, figure it out. Mm -hmm. So we went back. And then I was just going out buying groceries. And then when I came back, I saw all my stuff being thrown out out of his yard. And he, he switched the locks and told me, well, we're no longer brothers. You go, you go and fend for yourself because I'm not going to be doing that anymore. He kicked you out. He kicked me out. Okay. So and it's been lost a, your it's been, too. Yeah, it's been really rough. I, ha I haven't found work because of various reasons. And I mean, I, I don't know anyone here in Vancouver. He's not willing to help me at all. So it's been rough. Okay. Okay. So um, how long has it been since you lost your job or since you quit? So I've, the last time I worked was probably five months ago. About five yeah. months. Okay. So you know that the tribunal can order compensation for lost okay. wages. Okay. Are you seeking lost wages yeah. in this yeah. settlement negotiation? Yeah. Okay, good. And and what else are you seeking? Well, I saw this article from, from the province saying um, something about, I think it's called injury to dignity. Yes, injury to dignity is the other category okay. of damages that the tribunal can order. And you right. can seek that in this mediation as okay. well. What's, do you know what the maximum has been? There's no maximum, okay. but the highest amount the tribunal has ever ordered, and it was in a very serious case, the, uh, the award was $75,000. Okay. That's only ever happened once. Okay. Um, the majority of damages awards for injury to dignity are more in the five to $10,000 okay. kind well, of Well, I, I think my, my case is probably up there in terms of seriousness, so I'm going to ask for seventy. dollars Five thousand dollars. Seventy-five thousand. Well. Okay. And I also want him to issue a public apology, post it on his website, because mm -hmm. I want everyone to know how badly he treat, he mistreated me. Okay. I'm his brother. He mm -hmm. should know better. Mm -hmm. A public apology. Um, just so you know, the the tribunal. That's not something the tribunal would be able to order at mm -hmm. the end of the day. But that doesn't mean that you can't ask for it mm -hmm. in the context of this negotiation. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? I guess you've been paying rent now since he yeah, tossed so I, you I out. Want, I want all of that to be compensated as mm -hmm. well because I had to pay motel fees and I had to also 
finally be able to find some place to live. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would, I want him to compensate me for that as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think I have a good sense then of what you're looking for mm -hmm. overall in terms of compensation. Um, I, th I have to be honest with you. I think it's pretty unlikely that Jim will agree to 75,000 in injury to dignity, but okay. I can, I can take that to him and okay. we can see what he has to say. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Okay. So Jim, mm -hmm. uh, I've heard from Marco now okay. and got a bit of a better sense of what the complaint is all about. Okay. Um, and so what Marco tells me he's looking for through mm -hmm. this mediation, what would allow him to withdraw the complaint and, mm -hmm. um, and walk away is uh, a variety of, of kinds of compensation. First of all, he's looking for an apology from an you. An apology? He'd like a public apology uh, posted public, yeah. on your website, on okay. your company's website for what right. happened. Uh, he tells me that it's been about five months now since um, he felt he had to quit because of uh, your company's failure to accommodate his, his injury. Okay. So he's looking for five months of lost wages and he also tells me that um, he's no longer able to live with you in the way that he was before. Okay. And that he, of course, connects to the to the um, claim, mm -hmm. to the, his claim of discrimination. So he's also looking for compensation for those five months of rent okay. for you. Um, the final piece of what he's looking for is compensation for injury to dignity. And injury to dignity damages, as you might know, are a sort of subjective form of compensation for right, the, right. Lawyers, the pain, of yeah. pain and suffering. You've yeah. got some legal advice yeah. about that. So, um, so he's asking for $75,000. $75,000? Is he out of his mind? Well, I, I did tell him that that was a pretty big sum and uh, that I didn't expect you to wow. be agreeable to that. But what we can do here together today is exchange positions. So now you have his wow. initial position on settlement okay. and it is your right to uh, reject that and to propose a counter offer right. of what you would be willing to settle the case. Right. Well, that's quite unfortunate he's taking this sort of position. I was actually prepared to offer him some money. Um, I think before we came to this early settlement meeting, my lawyer recommended that the only thing I compensated was the, whatever the cost of his damaged suitcase, because that was the only valuable thing that, that I had threw out on his lawn. Everything else was trash, and I offered him $300 for that. I was thinking of actually increasing it to maybe somewhere along the lines of $3,000 to $4,000, but now he just hit me with this, what was it, 75000 He's out of his mind. Well, that I have to now really reconsider because there are things that I think you should probably know. My lawyer says the only reason why I need to pay him just the cost of those valuables is to essentially make him go away because he has no claim whatsoever. He says, what did he say? He said that he, I, I made him quit. Well, my understanding of his complaint is that when you hired him, mm -hmm. he made it very clear that he had a back injury and could only do certain mm -hmm. kinds right. of work. But then over time, um, he was required to do That's much more physical labor. That's not true. And, uh, and that injured his back further and there didn't seem to be any consideration of his physical limitations. That's not true. I kept telling him more. Marco, look, if at any point you feel that you're no longer able to do this, just tell me it and I'll find a replacement right away. We even got a replacement once, but he felt that this replacement was completely inadequate. He was incompetent and he felt that I should fire him and have him re replaced with him right away. And I told him, look, this is not going to be sustainable in the long run, but he insisted that he wanted to do the job. I was deeply concerned for him. And then one day out of the blue, he just tells me, oh, I can't do this anymore. Well, I mean, Marco, if you, I had given you 
several opportunities for, me, for you to tell me, give me the courtesy of giving me at least a few days notice, not just tell me the day of where we're wrapping up probably the biggest project in my whole business. Is, the whole business was worth $100,000. He left that day, I had to scramble to find someone else. We ended up losing almost $50,000 that day and now they're suing us because we performed inadequate services. Hmm. Well, this is um, helpful new information. Do I have your permission to share all of yeah. that information with yeah. Marco? Yeah, you could also tell Marco, I'm, I'm just going to stick with my original offer, which is just the $300 we proposed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. He's not getting anything else. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll communicate that to him. <coughs> so Marco, <laughs> I've spoken with Jim and um, as we predicted, he didn't accept your original really? proposal for $75,000 plus the five months of wage loss okay. and, the, uh, and the rent coverage. Um, and he provided me a bit more information about the claim that you mm -hmm. might find interesting as well. Um, what he says is that um, he tried to make it really clear to you that you didn't have to do the, the physical labor that you were doing. Um, from his perspective, he was giving you opportunities to, to not do that work, to let him know if mm -hmm. Things were making your back worse, but because you're such a you know a hard worker and a bit of a perfectionist, I think you really wanted to jump in and and get and do the work, and <coughs> you didn't think that the people that he had brought in were doing a good enough job, so that you actually were the one making the choice to do the work that was making your back worse. So he has a really different view of of how things went and. My sense is that um, he's prepared to go to a hearing if your position on settlement is going to be such a high one. Okay. He tells me that he put an offer on the table some time ago to compensate you for the suitcase that got damaged yeah, when was, he was yeah, throwing your stuff yeah, out the window. Yeah. Um, so that remains his position. Okay. I sense a little bit of flexibility okay. from him. Okay. I, I don't think... He's going to go to $75,000, okay. but I think if you were to make uh, a lower offer, that there's mm -hmm. some room for him to come up from his $300, okay. but it's not going to be all the way to 75. dollars okay. So just a bit of commentary. This is t very typical when you're negotiating against yourself. You pitch an offer to the other side, they basically counter with no. So the way you get around this is... Oh, well, Jim really doesn't know who to hire and he doesn't appreciate that you need very skilled workers in order to make the business sustainable. I get his point. He did, he did tell me that I can slow down, I can stop whenever I want, but this was, I mean, he's my brother and I felt obligated for me to continue working at my fullest. I can see where he's coming from. $300 just doesn't cut it for me. I can see why he's pretty upset with my offer of 75,000. It is a little high. At this point, I don't want to negotiate against myself. Would you be able to return to Jim and just ask him, look, I, I appreciate everything he just said. Um, the last offer I made was completely irrational. Would he be able to maybe give me a revised offer and I'll think about it I can do that I think he'll be he'll be glad to hear that okay. <laughs> um, so and then the day would go on right and then the mediator would go back to Jim and say okay Marco has acknowledged that that first offer was a little uh, unreasonable crazy outrageous perhaps but um, you know 300 is is too low for him you had mentioned three or four thousand maybe being a possibility. I think if you put that offer on the table, we might be able to get somewhere. And that would go back and forth like that. And I think that this scenario illustrates one of the dangers of starting with a really high number in a negotiation. You have to remember if you're going to a negotiation to a settlement meeting that success means 
meeting in the middle. It means compromise. It means a place where both parties can agree. And if you go in seeking $75,000 when the tribunal has only ever given that award one time and it was in a pretty serious situation, um, you're not going to get to a resolution. So there's some strategy, some tactical thinking that goes into preparing for a mediation. Of course, you also don't want to lowball yourself and ask for such a low amount that as the negotiations go on, you end up with much less than you are reasonably entitled to. So I think there is some strategy that goes into mm -hmm. coming from the complainant side to starting higher than you expect to get and then being willing to come down. And I think it's also true as happened in this scenario that the respondent is gonna start really low. And so both parties are gonna be in the kind of extreme positions and eventually, hopefully, work towards a middle, <coughs> middle kind of ground. Um, getting some legal advice before a mediation is a really great thing to do. And again, our clinic can do that. We can have even just a short conversation on the phone to say, about what do you think this complaint is worth? And what I would have advised Marco is to have some documents to support his claim for wage loss and rent. Even though Jim probably knows what Marco was getting paid and knows what, um, well, no, wouldn't know what he's been paying in rent since he got kicked out, um, you want to bring those documents just so you have them there to verify the costs that you're seeking. And if he was seeking, let's say he had to um, take additional uh, painkillers for his back because of the discrimination and he had to pay for those, you could bring receipts for those kinds of things too and ask for um, reimbursement for those costs. So it's helpful to bring documents with you to the mediation, even though there's no like legal requirement to do so. It can just, in my experience, really help the mediation go along if you can point to concrete things like pay stubs or T4s or receipts or, or other things that show um, the kind of compensation that you're looking for. You'll notice like I was neutral, right? I was not advocating for either side, but I was trying to communicate to Jim, Marco's perspective, and then back to Marco, Jim's perspective. And I also had some inside knowledge from each one of them that I didn't disclose. I didn't tell yeah. Jim, sorry, I didn't tell Marco, <clears throat> Jim would go up to $4,000, but I did tell Jim, you know, I sense some flexibility. I think if you come back with a more reasonable offer, we might be able to get somewhere. I don't think the 300 is his like bottom line. So you can kind of, um, as a mediator, you can kind of facilitate the process that way. And as a party, you mm -hmm. can sort of expect that the mediator isn't gonna share everything that they know, but they're gonna share things that they think will help the parties to negotiate and come to an agreement. And just flag for folks what other kinds of support in addition to our clinic, in addition mm -hmm. to employment law firms like Jim's, are out there to provide legal help to people with human rights and other issues. So, um, the tribunal website is a really useful source of information. There's a guide to <clears throat> settlement meetings. There's information about um, damages and compensation. There's all kinds of great information on the tribunal website. So that's a good place to go, bchrt.bc.ca. The Lawyer Referral Service is also a great resource. You can call them up and ask to get connected to a lawyer with expertise in your particular issue. And I actually send people to this service a lot when they have a human rights issue, but also some other employment related issue that I can't help with. Maybe there's a wrongful dismissal issue or a contract issue or something else in addition to human rights, you can call these folks up and for $25 get a half an hour of legal advice from an expert in that area. So that's a really good one to know about. Access Pro Bono 
is also an amazing resource. They also provide free legal advice from lawyers. They have a <clears throat> roster of lawyers that they can call up to provide help with a variety of different issues. And every once in a while, they also um, have a, I think they call it an advice-a-thon. <laughs> and in different communities, they have lawyers just set up a table and people can go and get a bit of advice. Um, just like right in person in the day in a public space somewhere in Vancouver. I think they're often at the art gallery um, And I think they do them in other communities, too. So they're um, good to look up You just write to them or call them and tell them what your issue is And they'll look at their list of lawyers that are willing to help by providing free legal services and see if they can match you up with somebody that can help you Disability Alliance of BC has um, all kinds of different support that they provide. Spring, you know about Disability Alliance, hey? They have legal advocates as well. Um, I don't know if their legal advocates do human rights things very often. I don't think so, but they can be super um, helpful with like applying for benefits, navigating all of the bureaucracy around like income tax issues and really the financial their biggest, their stuff. Biggest thing, their biggest thing is um, housing and um, what's the other one? Housing and uh, getting your disability benefits. Yeah. That's their mm -hmm. biggest one. Great. Thanks for that. That's helpful to have that. Those two specialties. I work, I, I work alongside some of their members. Great. So housing and benefits kinds of issues are the main things that disability If, if it's alliance. a human rights, they usually send it down to you guys. Yes. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. Um, and Work BC is um, uh, a government agency that um, some of you may know better than I do. I just learned about these folks in the last little while. But my understanding of Work BC is that they can help people with disabilities to, as this says here, discover job options and services designed to support people with disabilities and build your career here. And they can help support post-secondary education, um, get you some funding for uh, an assistive device or some kind of technology that you might need in order to succeed in the workplace, um, get job skills and training and even create or expand your own business, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've never worked with these folks, but I've certainly had cases where my client has worked with them and they've been really great to just help support them to find a new job, um, get training to move into a new line of work. Um, so they may be uh, worth looking up if, if that is something that would be beneficial and, and helpful for you. And Povnet, oh Povnet, we love Povnet. This is, so Povnet is um, a network of advocates who mainly advocate in the area of what we call poverty law, but really that just can encompass so much. Um, definitely housing issues, definitely benefits and income security type issues. They can probably help with like employment standards things. And there are advocates across the province. And what I love about this website is that you put your, this is a screenshot right from the website. You put your mouse over which part of the province you're in and a whole bunch of different service providers will pop up that serve that area. Now, all of us here <coughs> are in the lower mainland. So, um, Maybe resources are a bit easier to find in the Lower Mainland, but if you are in the Caribou or in the North, there aren't a ton of service providers, and this is a really good way to go out and find what's there. And you can also filter by different kind of service. You can see over on the right-hand side at the bottom, Aboriginal and First Nations, addictions and there's one for disability as well so you can click on that and you can find all of the advocates and service providers that provide assistance related to disability so those folks can be um, super helpful as well um, sources is an organization i know sarah our um, other co-presenter is really connected with and Sources has a service called Ask an Advocate. 
You can see the kinds of assistance they provide across the top, income assistance, disability, tenancy and housing, other income supports. Um, so really great organization based uh, here in Surrey, I believe, um, and uh, a great place to get information about those kinds of, of issues too. Again, not human rights necessarily, but we know that human rights often overlap with all sorts of different issues that people might be experiencing, so these can be um, sources could be a good source of support for, um, for those other issues. Is that the last one? Yeah, that was the last one. So do you have any other um, services that you refer people to or think are especially helpful? Um, yes, if any of you ever um, apply for EI and are denied EI benefits, um, the recommended websites you should visit or the Government of Canada's website on EI decisions and I think the other one is I think it's literally called unemployed.ca it will have very detailed information on everything related to EI.